So thank you all for coming along today. Um, as David said, I lead the Population Health Program here at Turning Point. We have about 15 projects we're working on, a lovely team of people. Um, and we work mainly with secondary data. So that's data that comes from other sources. We work with hospitals data, deaths data, policing data. We also do some primary data collection, but we work with big populations, um, lots of different samples, lots of different populations of interest, and work across alcohol, illicit drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, and also increasingly in the area of mental health. And please feel free to ask whatever questions you might like at any point. So, um, Working in the health field, often routine monitoring is something that, that people may be not so much aware of and certainly it, it, it falls outside of the clinical remit. Um, but what we do actually really underpins an evidence base that supports the development of responsive policy and responsive interventions without knowing what's happening in the population. And in specific populations we might be concerned about, it's not possible to then develop evidence-based interventions and policy responses to reduce harm. There's a need to explore innovative methods to respond to alcohol and drug related issues in the community and I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about why we need those innovative, innovative methods. And this particular project involved linkage of over 63,000 records um, to be able to better identify alcohol and drug related harms at a community and at a service delivery level and identify the, the pattern of transition through different care settings for an emergency attendance. So just to give you a little bit of background, here's um, some hospitalizations data just on three drug groups and, um, and there are a whole range of limitations around hospitals data that, that um, become apparent once you work with it quite a lot. And that's certainly not a critique of the hospital system, it's not a critique of the data system, it's simply that the, the system um, is designed to capture diagnoses, capture diagnostic groups, it's certainly not designed to capture the level of detail we need to really be able to understand alcohol and drug related harms at the level we need to be able to respond in policy. So this gives an indication of trends over time in, in three kinds of um, admissions to hospital. The top line is alcohol related um, presentations. And the, the bottom two lines are for benzodiazepines as a group. In hospitalizations data, it's not possible to drill down and understand specific um, benzodiazepine related harms. So we can't know if people are presenting more as a result of use of alprazolam, Xanax, or diazepam. We, we can't do that with the hospital's data on its own. And, um, and the bottom line there is for opioids, and that includes illicit opioids like heroin, but also pharmaceutical opioids. And once again, there's not that scope to drill down to the level to be really able to understand <coughs> what's happening in particular subpopulations. However, the data is useful for overall monitoring. So one of the key issues for us is that we know that there are populations we're going to miss. If we just examine hospitalizations data, there are a whole range of reasons why we'll miss populations. Um, we, we miss them because we can't, as I was saying, get that level of detail that we might need to know about particularly high-risk subpopulations or particularly high-risk patterns of drug use. Furthermore, not many people end up as a hospital admission. Um, very few people end up hospitalised and particularly for drug-related issues. Um, we know it's a very small proportion of people who show up in an emergency department end up being admitted. And the people who show up in an emergency department represent a very small proportion of people who are using substances in the community and a small proportion of people who are experiencing either acute or chron chronic harms associated with their use. So what we were doing in this project and in a number of other projects we're doing is developing systems to be able to allow us to better capture a, a broader understanding of what these harms are at a population level but also at a service delivery level and understand <laughs> where and how the patients we're particularly interested in, people who are experiencing acute harms associated with their alcohol and other drug use, how they actually interact with the system, where they go, who sees them and what opportunities there might be for intervention. So as I was saying, this is actually a feasibility study and it's unusual to do a feasibility <coughs> study that uses five years of data that links 63,000 records. We had 97,000 records in the data set and you'll see why in a moment we, we only linked 63,000. But a fabulous opportunity to explore patterns and characteristics of alcohol and drug related harm and how patients actually interact with the system from ambulance pickup right through to hospitalisation. So the ambulance attendance data comes from a fantastic project that we've been lucky enough to be um, doing since 1998, um, which is a collaborative project with Ambulance Victoria and it's funded by the Victorian Department of Health. And in that project we received data on a monthly basis from Ambulance Victoria of potentially alcohol and drug related ambulance attendances and undertake quite significant additional programming, 
data coding, review and case classification, to be able to give us an indication of those cases that are directly related to the over or inappropriate use of a drug. And, um, and that over or inappropriate use needs to have happened recently. So if somebody has liver cirrhosis because of long-term alcohol use, but they're not alcohol affected when they're seen by ambulance, we wouldn't include them. These are acute cases of inappropriate use. Um, it's a fantastic project. It's, there's nothing like it in the rest of the world, and it's really exciting to be able to work on it and gives us some fantastic data to be able to use that as a basis for this particular project. And I'd just like to say that last image and this image have been very kindly provided by Ambulance Victoria, who have some beautiful photographs which make this much more interesting than me presenting you with lots of slides of lots of words. Um, so the um, emergency department data comes from a Victorian emergency minimum data set which um, includes all emergency department presentations across the state for all 24-hour emergency departments. So it's, it's, it's a very um, substantial data set. Hospital admissions come from the Victorian Admitted Episode Database, which includes all private and public hospital separations for the state. Again, picks up every case. So we receive all hospitalisations data and all emergency department data, whether or not there's an indicator, indication in those data sets that the presentation is alcohol or drug related. So we have every single case. The linkage from ambulance to emergency department. Um, we used five years of data, as I said, so that was from 1st of July 2004 to the 30th of June 2009. And we matched using the case number for the ambulance attendants and the date and validated with a combination of the patient's age, their gender, the hospital they were transported to, the time between the attendance of ambulance and the emergency presentation, and through that we linked over 90% of records, which is a really fantastic linkage given that we didn't have patient name. Um, we do have patient age, but often it's not a date of birth. It's an estimated age based on the paramedics assessment. So without those unique identifiers of name, full date of birth, residential address, it, it was really quite a successful match and we're very pleased with the outcome of that. And so in terms of that feasibility issue, it certainly gives us good scope to be able to do more work. So to give you a bit of an overview, these are the drug groups that we... Um, that we code for in, in our AMBO project um, that I mentioned before. And so these are the drug groups that are available for the linkage study as well. So you can see on the left that we code for a whole range of illicit substances. Um, we also code as other substances, synthetic cabinoids, um, and also emerging psychoactive substances, research chemicals, for example. But on the right-hand side, importantly, we code for a whole range of illicit drugs. And, um, and we code for alcohol, which is a significant contributor to burden. Um, but we also code for a whole range of pharmaceutical drugs. And not only do we code for those drug groups, we actually code for specific preparations within those drug groups. So as I was mentioning before, we can examine attendance as related to alprazolam as opposed to diazepam. We've um, recently published a paper in Drug and Alcohol Review looking at atypical antipsychotics. So for those of you who um, are familiar with Seroquel or Quetiapine, <laughs> examining increasing harms associated with that drug and presentations associated with that compared with other atypical antipsychotics. So we can compare like with like with other drugs that are used in the same way, used for similar purposes, and really be able to understand what's happening in particular populations at risk. So we have an amazing level of detail. The characteristics we examined included age, gender, overall, and I won't be presenting every drug group for you, but there were 18 drugs and drug groups that we examined. I won't do that today. Um, the issue of polydrug use, the location of residence of the patient as well as the location of attendance, um, <coughs> the triage scale when they present to emergency department, length of stay both in the emergency department and in the hospital if they were admitted to hospital, whether or not they left the emergency department at their own risk, so against medical advice, um, we use diagnostic codes both in the emergency department data and also hospitalisations. However, because of the, the scope in linking these three data sets, we actually have the capacity to be able to examine any variables that occur in any of those data sets. So this gives you a bit of an overview, and I've got a number of slides that look like this, so um, hang in there. Um, so what we can see here are the number of records that, that we had that were alcohol and drug related each year. 
and the numbers that we selected for matching. So we code for things like alcohol involvement, where the patient's not necessarily alcohol intoxicated. We didn't link those records unless there was another drug involved. So there were some cases that we include in our data set, but we don't necessarily include for linkage purposes. And there were some drug groups, due to the low numbers of cases, that we didn't include in our reporting. So um, attendance is related to opioid pharmacotherapy, for example. The numbers are incredibly low what we see, and, um, and so we didn't include that in our reporting. However, we have the information available if we were to, to explore it in the future. And so what we can see here, and the, the important things to think about here, I think, are the, are the two bottom lines. So the proportion of patients who were attended by ambulance, who were acutely drug affected, either by alcohol or other drugs or a combination, and the proportion who actually ended up presenting to emergency department and being examined in the emergency department, because we do see a certain number of patients arriving at the emergency department and then leaving before they're assessed. And we look at it, it's about two-thirds of the patients who are attended by ambulance for alcohol and other drug-related issues who actually end up being seen in the emergency department. About a third of patients don't get to that point. And there are a number of reasons why they don't. Depending on the drug group, there's quite a lot of variability, but we certainly see a lot of patients who refuse transport, even though it's, it's medically recommended, it, the paramedics are, are requiring transport and the patient is refusing. And we see that as a more common feature of certain drug presentations. Um, and, um, and sometimes patients will be treated at the scene and they won't require further treatment. So not all patients attended by ambulance for an acute alcohol and drug-related harm even see an emergency department. And as you can see in the bottom line, very few patients, comparatively speaking, actually end up being admitted to hospital at all. So if you think back to that first slide that we looked at, in hospital, uh, hospitalizations over an extended period of time, this really highlights the fact that this is a very small proportion of the harm that we're seeing at a community level and the harm that we're seeing in terms of people actually making use of emergency services, be that ambulance or emergency department. Um, so it's about 15% in the last year of the study were actually admitted to hospital, so a very small proportion of those patients who were transported to hospital. This gives an indication of heroin-related attendances, and this really highlights that for different drug groups there are really different, um, different outcomes for patients and different processes for patients in terms of accessing different services. And what we can see here is it's only about a third of patients who are attended by ambulance for a heroin-related um, reason actually are transported to hospital. And the main reason why they're not transported to hospital, you can move to the front if it's easier to see with that pole in the way. Um, uh, the main reason they're not transported to hospital is that it, even though the paramedics are recommending that they're transported and be treated in hospital, the patients are refusing. And we know that's a feature of heroin-related attendances. Whether or not naloxone is administered, um, we, we do see this very low uptake of the option of, being, of receiving further care in the emergency department. And very, very, very few heroin-related um, cases actually end up being a hospital admission. It's about 6%. So very low numbers end up in the hospital. Over time, we've, it's been consistently the case that, um, that males are more likely than females to be presenting as a heroin-related attendance. It's about 45% of patients who are attended um, in this group are actually attended in the same local government area as they live. So their residential location and their, their um, location of attendance are, are the same for about 45% of cases. We've seen relative stability over time in, in, who, in the proportions of patients who end up in ED, who end up in hospital, and, um, and relative stability over time in how long they stay in each of those settings as well. Ooh. I went forward. Ooh. No, no, no. There we go. So GHB-related attendances, there's been quite a bit of fluctuation over time in these. We've seen a slight increase in the, in the average age of patients who are attended by ambulance and who end up in each of these settings. Given the nature of, of the type of presentation for GHB, where there's a very narrow window of relative safety and a very high risk of, of overdose and um, respiratory depression, um, we see a much higher proportion of patients being transported to the emergency department and a much higher proportion actually being admitted to hospital. Amphetamine-related attendances, um, again, we see lower rates of, of transfer and we see lower rates of hospitalisation. And over time, we've seen an increase in male patients. We've also seen an increase in, um, in polydrug use in this group. And interestingly, in, in our attendances overall, 
And also in our heroin and GHB related attendances, we've seen a decrease in poly drug use in this group. And so this is poly drug in the context of how they actually present to ambulance, so whether they have multiple substances um, contributing to the attendance at the time of the attendance. And we've really seen that, in, that increase over time in this particular population group. We see a much lower concordance between where patients are actually attended by ambulance and where their residential location is. And I think that really sort of speaks to, to what we know about GHB use and, it, and its use in certain um, social contexts and that people are often travelling to particular events and that's where they will use their GHB. Oh, I, I do apologise, I was talking amphetamine. Um, I suppose one of the other things to think about with amphetamine related attendances as well is that um, this only goes up to 2008, 2009. We're seeing a whole range of indicators of increasing um, amphetamine use and particularly crystal or ice use in the community and particularly harm rather than use. So even though population surveys are indicating relative stability in, in the numbers of people who are reporting that they're using um, ice, we're seeing in high risk populations injecting drug users and, and very regular drug users increasing patterns of use. But certainly across more recent data from ambulance, from direct lines of so the telephone um, services here at Turning Point that, are, that run for the whole state, and also alcohol and drug specialist treatment episodes, a real increase in amphetamine related presentations. So we're seeing increasing harms at a community level. And the likelihood is that what, what the evidence is starting to suggest is those increases are happening in particularly high risk populations in long term chronic users who are experiencing very complex health issues associated with their use. Amphetamines are actually quite difficult to pull out of hospitals data, for example, because they're, they're grouped into a stimulants category that can include a whole range of different things. It's not um, possible to readily identify ecstasy-related uh, admissions as opposed to amphetamine-related admissions, for example, and you'll have a whole range of stimulants jumping into that group, pharmaceutical stimulants, for example. So for benzodiazepines, we see a really different picture. So for all of those other drug groups, they're dominated by men. Benzodiazepine-related attendance is the majority of those are for women and the vast majority of those occur in the same um, residential, the same area as the patient resides. So it's about 85% of benzodiazepine attendances are in the same local government area as the patient's residential location. And we've seen relative consistency in that over time. What we have seen a real increase in is the proportion of these cases where the patients also have other drugs involved in these. So we're seeing an increase in both pharmaceutical drugs, illicit drugs and also alcohol in these presentations which really increases the complexity of these cases and the risk of um, adverse outcomes. Um, we're talking about quite serious cases of overdose and, and of course death, particularly with the combination of central nervous system depressants. What we can see here is a much higher proportion of cases actually get transpo tra transported to the ED and get treated in the ED and also get transferred through to hospital and that's compared with what we see for the illicit drugs. There's much higher uptake of that, that need to, to be transferred to hospital. We're talking about illicit substances so there's potentially less stigma associated with transferring through to an emergency department and being treated in a hospital. We're also seeing often much more complex cases but as I was saying in terms of gender, in terms of the location, they're also a fundamentally different group or there are subgroups that are fundamentally different to what we see for illicit drugs. Non-opioid analgesics, there's not a great deal of information available about these and uh, just to give you a little bit more information about what drugs are in group included in this group, this includes over-the-counter um, analgesics like paracetamol, ibuprofen, aspirin, it also includes combinations with codeine of those drugs. It's not possible in terms of the information that we receive um, in the data that we have to identify if, if a drug's an over-the-counter um, uh, panadine um, as opposed to a panadine fort, that that information isn't necessarily consistently available. So we're talking about the paracetamols, the ibuprofens, the aspirins. And, um, and again, this is an area where we see absolutely dominated by female patients increasing polydrug use in this group or increasing polydrug presentation in this group over time and there are certainly significant risks of, of both immediate but also longer term harm with these kinds of attendances and that's something we see as patients who are presenting a number of days after a paracetamol overdose for example when they're starting to become symptomatic and they're starting to become symptomatic because their liver is starting to shut down due to the paracetamol toxicity that symptoms don't appear straight away. We also see a lot of combination of substances in this group too. And again, 
attendance is likely to occur near their patient's home. But as you can see here as well, that we see it, it, the majority of patients do get transported through to the emergency department and about a quarter end up being hospitalised. Um, again, to be able to actually drill down on this information and to be able to explore it in hospitals data is quite limited in our capacity to be able to do that. So alcohol related attendances, and this is the last of these lovely diagrams I'll be showing you and we'll move on to something else and we'll talk a little bit more about alcohol intoxication. Over time we've seen a real increase in alcohol intoxication related attendances and in this instance these are uh, cases where the patient is acutely alcohol intoxicated and as far as we can determine there are no other drugs involved. So this is alcohol only. We can look at alcohol and other drugs but in this case this is alcohol alone. We've seen a substantial increase over time in, in the numbers of cases that ambulance are seeing and it's certainly by far and away the most common drug related attendance that ambulance uh, sees. Um, but we're also seeing an increase over time in patients who are transported to the emergency department and also an increase in the, the, the patients who are actually admitted to hospital. There's a little bit of an increase in length of stay. This is dominated by men again, about two thirds of men. Um, but as you can see here, it's only, again, two-thirds of attendances who are, that are actually transported through to hospital, so uh, to the emergency department. So, again, if we looked at emergency data or we looked just at hospital data, we would be missing a substantial burden on ambulance services and a substantial burden on the community. Some demographics for you. So there's been relative stability in the proportion of alcohol intoxication cases where the patient is male. We're interested in things like the proportion that occur in outdoor spaces and the proportion that occur in public spaces, particularly around public amenity, issues of, um, of access to services in the event that there the, is an intoxication case or an injury. We see in this group um, cases of, of alcohol poisoning and alcohol overdose, um, alcohol intoxication, but we also see injuries, we also see violence, we also see motor vehicle accidents where the patient's intoxicated. So these can be co-occurring injury and, and, um, and intoxication cases. We have some information about age of patients who are acutely alcohol <coughs> intoxicated. And um, what we can see over time, and this is something that often um, people are surprised by, we haven't seen an increase in the proportion of patients who are young people. Um, even though there's a lot of focus on, on youth drinking and risky drinking and um, alcohol fueled violence among young people, we haven't actually seen an increase in the proportion of patients who, who are under 30. Um, what we have seen, however, and if you can just focus on the last two rows, which are the 60 to 69 year olds and the 70 plus, between those two groups, they've gone from 8% of attendances to 13% of attendances. And this is in the context of an increase overall in alcohol related attendances that we've seen over time and quite a substantial increase over this five year period as well. And that's really a significant issue and certainly can relate to those increases we're seeing in transport to hospital, admission to hospital and increasing length of stay as well. But certainly raises a whole range of issues in terms of alcohol related harm among people who are ageing and the combined risks that, that older populations can potentially have associated with alcohol misuse as there are changes in metabolism, as there are changes in, in um, prescribed medications, for example, that people might be receiving, that um, alcohol intoxication combined with those factors can actually substantially increase the risk of a whole range of harms, can increase the risk of falls, of other accidents um, and other harms associated with alcohol consumption. So it's certainly an area that's a significant concern and we're seeing it as an increasing area of concern for that population group that is really I think underrepresented in how um, as a community we understand alcohol related harms. That In the media there's a lot of attention on that under 30 group and particularly the under 25s but the over 60s are certainly not represented in, um, in tabloid portrayals of alcohol related harms. In the re that ageing population, is there anything re the location? You know, like we hear about you know, some suburbs are kind of demographically older than sort of other suburbs. Uh, we, in, the, um, in the reporting that we do as part of the AMBO project, the annual reporting that we do, we actually map attendances over time and so there are actually postcode level and local government area level maps and so we can examine over time how intoxication cases change. Um, we haven't mapped for specific subpopulations but we certainly could for older groups um, and changes within those groups and that there are sufficient numbers, there are so many cases of acute intoxication that we could do that. Um, we have seen a bit of a shift over time in where we see alcohol related harms overall in the community 
Um, it's, of course, um, I, I suppose, um, led by um, Melbourne inner city, and that's simply because that's where people are moving to, to drink on a weekend, for example. Um, but that ability to actually look at residential location as opposed to where people are actually being picked up is certainly a really good opportunity to examine those issues of where people are, are drinking. Interestingly though, the intoxication cases in, in this particular study, um, the majority of, of uh, attendances were actually in the same local government area as the patient resided. So even though we do see this influx into the inner city, we also see significant issues around alcohol intoxication and alcohol related harm across communities and in um, outer local government areas, inner local government areas, so across the state. And, um, and that probably is something that we don't know enough about and how that interacts with alcohol availability and alcohol pricing in, um, in different areas and in, in outer local government areas, for example, where you might have um, increased availability of packaged liquor and drinking at home and drinking at friends' homes and, um, and the risks that are associated with that we, we probably need to know more about. Um, so some information on how these patients are actually coded once they get to the emergency department. Um, we know that we'll, we will miss a lot of patients if we just pick up data from the emergency department. There are three codes that clinicians can potentially, three options, so it's three spaces for codes um, for a patient. Um, the top one here, so the most common um, ICD code or diagnosis that's given in the emergency department for these patients who we know from the ambulance data are acutely alcohol intoxicated when they show up to the emergency department. What we can see here is the top one, and this um, is mental and behavioural disorders due to psychoactive substance use. This um, incorporates um, acute intoxication but also alcohol dis dependence disorders. And we can see there it's under 40% consistently across time. And again, this is the patients we know are acutely intoxicated when they get to the emergency department. The second most, or not the second most common one, but the other um, diagnostic group that we'd be expecting to see that relates to acute intoxication is around the toxic effects of a substance. <coughs> so this really gets to alcohol poisoning, for example, and is used much less than, than the um, uh, mental and behavioural disorders, which includes intoxication. But we've seen a decrease over time, a little bit of a decrease in using these codes in the emergency department. Certainly when we look across the codes, we see a whole range of different things. We seem to have had a little bit of an increase in bites, for example, as the, as the only diagnosis that's given when a person ends up in the emergency department, all sorts of interesting bites. So that's you know, something that we weren't expecting. But I think that one thing that's really important to highlight here is the third row down, um, which is injuries to the head. And that's increased enormously over the five years. So we've gone from 2.5% of, um, of patients who we know are transported, acutely intoxicated, end up in the emergency department. 2.5% had a diagnosis suggesting they had an injury to he the head. And over a five-year period, that's gone up to nearly 13%. It's a massive increase. And this is a massive increase that then gives way to significant concern. So we're seeing an increase in older patients and we're seeing an increase in head injuries. And what then that means for, um, for support and intervention and also the, um, the combination of a whole range of risk factors and harms that can increase um, adverse outcomes for patients. So we're talking here about risk of acquired brain injury and coupling that with the risk of alcohol-related brain injury and the increasing complexity of these patient groups and the risk of harm. These are hospital admissions, and so we know only a small proportion of those alcohol intoxicated patients ended up being admitted to hospital. But here we can see a, sim a similar pattern. So what we can see here is that the, the two diagnostic groups that would relate to intoxication or alcohol dependence are, um, you know, when we're thinking we know all of these patients were intoxicated when they got to the emergency department, really comparatively low. So less than 50% of these patients have a principal diagnosis that indicates that, that there's an alcohol-related issue here. But again, injuries to the head have gone up from just under 4% to over 15% in the five years. And again, that's a significant issue. And those injuries to the head are likely to be contributing to the increase we're seeing in hospital admission and, ho and length of stay among intoxicated patients. So that's enough of the data. We can move on to the, the outcomes and the conclusions here. Um, so it's just important to flag a few limitations. There are always limitations with any study, with any research and with any project. Um, it's important to note that, that none of these three data sets are actually collected for research purposes. As much as I'd like to have every data system in the country collected in a way that suits my needs, 
Um, that's simply not the case. They're collected for clinical purposes and they're collected for administrative purposes. And whilst alcohol and drug is an issue, it's certainly not the primary issue for developing these systems. There are needs for consistency across states, there are needs for consistency across regions, there's need for international consistency for reporting requirements that we have, but also it's not appropriate to expect clinicians in the emergency department in the hospital or paramedics to give the level of detail around alcohol and drug involvement that we're interested in for our purposes. So we um, undertake activities to be able to make the data more useful for what we're interested in, to, to really build on what's already being done. We're mindful that coding practices can change over time and we work very closely with our colleagues at Ambulance Victoria and also with the Department of Health to be able to identify any changes that may occur in, um, so for example in diagnostic coding that may relate to funding changes or professional development changes in terms of the, the clinical coders and how they're, they're trained to actually identify um, diagnoses in the data and so we're very mindful of that to take that into account. And it's important to note there are going to be some missing cases it was not possible to link 100% of cases, it never is in a linkage study, so we will have some cases we miss. However, we can do some modelling of, of what the characteristics are of those patients we miss so that we can better understand what might actually contribute to that. Um, also, of course, as this is a linkage study from ambulance to emergency department to hospital, if a patient um, is transported to the emergency department by family or friends, takes themselves there, jumps in a taxi after having a fall when they're intoxicated, um, they're not going to be included in this linkage study. However, because we have all records for emergency department, there are ways we can address that, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we're very mindful of those issues and, and mindful of what those limitations are. So in terms of outcomes of this study, this feasibility study that we, we undertook, so the feasibility of the method has been established. We were able to successfully link. Um, we were able to successfully link a much higher proportion of cases than we thought we might be able to, so that was fantastic. It's nice to have those kinds of wins. And this kind of method can provide us with an evidence base um, regarding um, the nature of alcohol and other drug presentations in settings where we don't routinely have that information available. So if we think back to the proportion of cases in ED and the proportion of cases in hospital where we know the patient was intoxicated, it was consistently under 50% that had an alcohol-related diagnosis. So this is a really fantastic method to be able to pick up those cases that we wouldn't be able to if we just used one data system. Using multiple data sources is really necessary to, to be able to understand and estimate alcohol and other drug harms. If we look just at one data system or if we look just at one setting, we're going to miss really important populations and really important issues. And this method can really contribute to policy and intervention across and within treatment settings. So there are some fantastic opportunities to build on this to develop targeted screening, brief intervention and also referral systems and, um, and it really does give us great information about where patients end up, what kind of exposure patients have to different kinds of services. If a third of patients who are alcohol and drug um, impacted sufficiently to call an ambulance don't actually end up in an emergency department or a hospital, what opportunities are there for intervention and referral at that early point? If, um, if so few end up in a hospital bed as an admitted patient, what can we do in emergency departments to address that? It allows us opportunities to improve linkages through different care settings to support patients and reduce harms. And it also gives us really important information to, to be able to start thinking about how to refine resource planning um, and address these issues through targeting high peak times now that we have more information about emergency department presentations and hospital admissions and to be able to really focus on particular populations who are likely to um, disproportionately impact on emergency departments for example and um, require many resources and to be able to really target resource planning to fit those populations. We have things like time of day um, of, of the actual attendance and the ED presentation in this data as well so we can really do some very neat um, demand planning work. Um, we also, and, and as an epidemiologist, I'm particularly interested in how we model things and how we estimate burden and how we estimate harm. Um, so it, it gives us some fantastic opportunities to think about how we might do that and how we might do that in a more sophisticated way than how we've traditionally done um, as, a, as, a, as a sector. Um, 
it really allows us to look more closely at, at estimating the contribution of alcohol and other drug related um, presentations in emergency departments and other settings. Now that we have indications of, of what things might actually predict uh, a presentation to emergency department and how they're coded in the emergency department, we can actually start to build estimation models to say, well, of the patients who walk in who aren't transported by ambulance, with similar characteristics in terms of their demographics, with similar characteristics in terms of their diagnostic codes, we can then start to build up estimates of the, the true burden on emergency departments. Because we can also see in that emergency department data the patients who were transported by ambulance, where well, we know that they weren't alcohol and drug related cases. So we can actually build some really neat models. We can enhance the sensitivity of measures such as etiological fractions, and this is something that we use routinely um, in epidemiological work. And so these are, these are um, alcohol attributable and drug attributable fractions to, that we use to calculate alcohol and drug involvement in cases in hospital and, um, and in other settings. And we can really use this to, to fine tune how we actually use that information and make it more responsive to what we're really seeing in, at a population level. It also gives us scope to be able to explore comparative models um, of drug specific impact on different service settings. So this means we can do things like um, model the cost of different kinds of drug related presentations to ED and to hospital for example. So we can look at things like length of stay and the services that are provided for patients who um, who are transported because they uh, have um, had, ha had a harm associated with paracetamol use and compare that in terms of numbers but also the relative burden with heroin related attendances. We can compare different pharmaceutical related attendances and actually be able to examine what the relative burden is on particular services and, and what that, the true cost is because at the moment the costs that we have for alcohol and other drug related harms in the community are, are quite broad costs making a lot of assumptions and this really allows us to better understand what the true cost is to services. And that's certainly really important in advocating for funding but also in advocating for enhanced service delivery and being able to um, better target limited resources as we work in a very um, resource poor environment. There's an opportunity to, to um, continue and to, to develop this current methodology to provide ongoing um, analysis over time to be able to identify emerging issues or changing patterns of treatment and service engagement. But furthermore, there's also capacity to expand this to look at other data sets so we can actually look at a whole range of different outcomes and expanded concepts of service engagement. So we could certainly potentially link this data to mortality data so we can look at outcomes um, in a larger sense and, and certainly a very final outcome. We can potentially link to things like um, specialist alcohol and other drug treatment service data to actually see how patients engage. We don't know at the moment what proportion of these patients have ever had any access to a specialist alcohol and other drug service, if they ever will, if accessing alcohol and other drug treatment services actually reduces their service use of these kinds of very high cost services. Um, we can also do a similar kind of thing for mental health service utilisation. More broadly outside of the health sphere there's potential, potential to, um, to be able to link with things like policing and justice data so we can actually look more broadly at the issue of harm that harms our patient populations are experiencing and how they might change with different intervention opportunities and different responses. And also look at, at other outcome indicators like welfare service usage like housing availability, access to housing and how secure housing may actually improve outcomes for these patient populations. Just a few things to do. Um, so really using a surveillance system like this really allows us to model and to be able to understand populations that we can't understand in other ways and enhance the data that we already have. It's a remarkably cost effective way to actually be able to get a, a, a much better indication of the impact of alcohol and other drugs in the community, its impact on patients but also its in impact on services and opportunities to improve service delivery. We can monitor the success of interventions by using this mechanism. And as I was saying, we can look at community and service level costs and how we can return on investment in different kinds of services and really get a good income about how different interventions and how different services actually um, uh, provide us with a real investment in pr improving outcomes in the population.
And it also allows us to really monitor outcomes across populations but also within populations. So if we were interested, say, in following up a population group who were admitted to hospital with an alcohol-related diagnosis and we wanted to do that patient by patient, it would be prohibitively expensive. It would involve getting approval to contact them and contact details and chasing them up and trying to do that over a period of time and to be able to get information with a relatively low return and a very high cost. This is a relatively low cost and high return because we get whole population coverage, which is very exciting. I'd just like to acknowledge a number of people and groups. Um, this particular project was funded by the Victorian Department of Health through the Victorian Law Enforcement Drug Fund. Um, the VEMD and VAED, so the Emergency Department and Hospitals data, was provided by the Victorian Department of Health. The ambulance data was derived from the AMBO project, which I've mentioned before, is this fabulous collaborative project between Turning Point and Ambulance Victoria, and, um, and just a, a lovely model of how different agencies can work together to really value add to data that's collected. Um, and it, that's funded by the Victorian Department of Health. And I'd just also like to really thank the project team, Jason Ferris, Sharon Matthews, and Paul McElwee, who without, um, without them, this project certainly wouldn't have got to this point. Um, and that's it. So